Today, we continue our series in the Home Improvements series with a message entitled, The Bathroom, A Place for Cleansing. Uh, yeah, go ahead and laugh. It's not like that, but go ahead. <laughs> the title's picked on purpose to kind of pique attention, and it kind of comes from my oldest son, Zachary. He asked me several weeks ago, he said, Daddy, if you're going to do a sermon on every room of the house, are you going to do one on the bathroom? You know, leave it to an 11-year-old to ask that question. And, but you know what? He's right. I had planned to do this message because um, if you think about it, the bathroom is a rather essential room of the house. And if you're like me, you realize just how essential the bathroom was during the first 24 hours or so after Hurricane Laura. If you're like our house, we had no power and no water and no sewer. And... I'll admit that we had not prepared adequately for the hurricane. We had never lost water before. So I didn't fill a bathtub up with water. We didn't have jugs of water available. And so when we woke up to no water, we had a partial gallon of distilled water that Rebecca keeps by the iron and five or six bottled waters to drink from. And so I thought, whew, we'll make it. Well. As hour went into hour, the toilet got grosser and grosser. And <laughs> as I washed my hands with that little bit of water that we were preserving in our 90-degree house with 285% humidity, uh, I was getting ready for the funny farm. And um, I have to admit that when the water came on, I was probably more elated than when the electricity came back on. And now we're just waiting on Sudden Link to come back on. And thank you, Mike Johnson, for uh, your work in that. Let's give Mike a hand. Yeah. Mike, I think you're a hero of Central Louisiana right now. We're cheering you on, brother. We're praying for you. Thank you for all that you do for our area. Well, so, you know, we realized in a hurricane how important a bathroom really is. Some of you may have grown up uh, without an indoor bathroom or maybe you remember going to a grandparents house that didn't have an indoor bathroom and so you remember going out to the outhouse and having to cleanse yourself with pages from the Sears Roebuck catalog instead of some fluffy Charmin and some of you remember having to bathe in a galvanized uh, metal tub outside and it really stunk to be the youngest kid literally because you got to take a bath after everybody else had taken a bath in the same water they had taken a bath in. <laughs> and those were lovely days, weren't they? God bless them. But now I assume that we all have an indoor bathroom and we are grateful for that, no matter its age, no matter its aesthetics. And it takes a hurricane sometimes to make you grateful for what you have. We enter the bathroom in need of cleansing. We exit the bathroom having been cleansed. And one of the greatest needs in our families is cleansing, but we need far more than physical cleansing. So this morning, as important as physical cleansing is, I don't want to talk about the cleansing that comes about from a roll of Charmin or, or a bar of Dial, and I'm sure you're glad of that. We're going to talk about the spiritual cleansing that comes from God coming into our life and doing a new and powerful work. So today I want to talk about the spiritual cleansing that we all need and God so freely offers to us. If you want to have a strong family, you need to find this cleansing. Cleansing is a home improvement you must make. So please turn in your copy of God's Word, if you haven't already, to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel is found over in the Old Testament, right amidst the other major prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. And remember, the only difference in a major prophet and a minor prophet is the major guys were long-winded. And so their books are a lot longer. And now when you uh, hear me mention a prophet's name, and you hear, turn to the book of Ezekiel. Don't lean to your spouse or friend and say, night, night. I realize sometimes the prophets kind of create this idea that boredom and, and we don't understand them. But Ezekiel has some really clear things to share with us today that I think are going to be beneficial to us. A little background on this guy, Ezekiel. When he was 25 years old, Ezekiel was exiled to Babylon from Judah. And this was 10 years before the final destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians when everyone else was exiled to Babylon. Um, 
Ezekiel lived during this time with his wife among the Jewish exiles. And because of his exiled condition, when Ezekiel reached 30 years of age, the year an eligible man could become a priest, he wasn't able to do so because he wasn't in Jerusalem. Ezekiel had grown up in the house of a priest, and so he, was, he would have been next up to become a priest. But because he was exiled away from Jerusalem and the temple, there was no way for him to fulfill his calling. Therefore, for five years of the exile, from the time when Ezekiel was uh, 25 to the time he was 30, the people had no preacher in Babylon. But when Ezekiel became 30 years old, in the same year that he would become a priest, God called him to serve as a prophet. And Ezekiel would prophesy the fall of Jerusalem, he would prophesy the exile, and he would prophesy the, Ezek the e eventual return and restoration. In our text for today, Ezekiel particularly shares about the cleansing that will come along with the restoration that God is going to bring about. But before you can really understand the cleansing that God is going to bring to the people of Israel and that he wants to bring to us, we've got to realize why the cleansing was needed in the first place. And that's exactly where Ezekiel begins. Have you ever gone into the bathroom knowing you needed a cleansing? There's probably been many days like that over the last few weeks as you've done cleanup in your yard and the humidity's been so high and it's been so hot. There was one particular Saturday two or three weeks ago where uh, my son Zach and I had been doing disaster relief cleanup at my mom's and, and we were hot and sweaty and we got into the car to head home and, and, and Zach said, Daddy, I think I, think I smell both of us. And, and, I, and I agreed. I smelled him. He smelled me. And he said, Mama's going to say straight to the showers when we walk inside. And, you know, it didn't matter what Rebecca said. We were heading straight to the showers. We were just gross. We knew we needed cleansing. Unfortunately, the Jewish people didn't really realize that they needed that kind of cleansing. Therefore, Ezekiel helps them understand. As Ezekiel begins chapter 36, he informs the people of the destruction that has come, why it has come. And in verses 16 to 19, he explains how unclean the people had become. I'd like for you to look there, Ezekiel 36, 16 to 19. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. You see the kind of defilement that the people had brought upon the land that God had given them. They had... Uh, worshipped false gods when the one true God had given them this particular land. Then even as God's people were exiled among the Assyrians and then the Babylonians in punishment for their sins, they continued to defile the name of the Lord their God. If for no other reason than their witness had been shot because they had lost the land that God had given them. God has a lot of concern for his name. Look at verse 20. Whenever they went, wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name, for it was said of them, these are the Lord's people. And yet they had to leave his land. God is very concerned about the sake of his name. And in verse 21 then, God declares his concern for his name, and then he says why he will restore Israel. Look at verse 21. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. So God says he's going to clean up his people in order to clean up the reputation of his name. 
But how's he going to go about doing that cleansing? Well, that's the focus of our focal text for this morning, verses 24 through 29. Look at verse 24. God says, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. What's the purpose of cleansing? Why do we go in to a bathroom dirty and expect to come out clean? We want to get clean so that we can be restored, right? We want to be restored to where we were in our clean state before we got so dirty, before we got so messed up. And so though these people were scattered around, God wants to bring restoration. He wants to bring cleansing. And so in these verses, we see a clear pattern of cleansing that brings restoration. And the first thing that God says he's going to do, he says God will bring the people to the place of cleansing. This would be the promised land. And though the people were scattered and exiled as a punishment for their sins, when the punishment was complete, God would remove his people from those nations where they were exiled. He would bring them back so that they could be his people again in the land that he had promised to give them originally. So God's going to bring them to the place of cleansing. The second thing that God says he's going to do is he's going to give his people a shower. He's going to cleanse them from their sins. Look at verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Remember that Ezekiel grew up in a priest household. So he was very familiar with the workings of the temple. He was very um, familiar with ritual washings that took place at the temple in preparing for worshiping God. And so Ezekiel picks up that image of those ritual washings and saying, God's going to sprinkle you. He's going to give you a shower that will cleanse you. But this shower that Ezekiel mentions is far more than a ritual. It is The promise of cleansing by God that will bring total and complete transformation if the people will repent. You see, this cleansing begins with a repentance on the part of the people. They had to acknowledge their need for cleansing. It was essential that people repent and acknowledge their past iniquity in order for God to be able to come in and cleanse cleanse them. Once they said, I'm dirty, I need a shower, then they could step under the cleansing shower of God's mercy and His grace and His forgiveness, and they could abandon their past, they could repent of their sin, and they would one by one admit, I am a sinner in need of your cleansing, Lord. Forgive me, though my sins are like scarlet, wash me as white as snow. And he would. And as those sins were washed away, they would understand how gracious was their cleansing. They would do like I did one of those days when I was so dirty after being out and my legs were caked with dirt and I stood in the shower and watched the dirt run off my body and down the drain. And that's what these people would do as God brought forgiveness to them. They could look in that shower and see all the filth washing off of them and going down the drain of God's forgiveness and forgetfulness. What a blessed thought. Ezekiel was looking down through time when the blood of Christ would wash away the sins of every person who steps under its life-giving flow. Do you have sins that need to be washed away today? Is there a sin that that is just continually weighing you down? Maybe it's worry or anger or lust or jealousy, 
deceit, unfaithfulness, neglect, gluttony, fornication, drunkenness, addiction, laziness, folly. If I didn't list yours, stick it in there. I mean, what is it that's all over you that's affecting your family that needs to be washed away so that you can experience what God wants to do in your life and in your family's life? Would you admit your need for cleansing today and repent of the sin that's in your life and allow God to come and wash it away through his shower of mercy and grace and forgiveness. It'll be the best shower you've ever had. The release will be freeing. The cleansing will be refreshing. Step away from the sin and into the shower. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus what about this question are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That is a question for all of us today. If you'll step into the shower of blessing, you won't even be near done, though, with all God wants to do in you through the cleansing process. For you see, God's process of cleansing that leads to restoration doesn't just stop with a shower. Third, God's going to give his people a new heart. Verse 26, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. So while he's doing the cleansing of us, he's going to perform a spiritual heart transplant. And when the Bible speaks about our heart, he's not talking about the organ that's beaten inside of us. He's talking about our entire person. Not just our will, not just our desires, but all of us. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, he transforms you from the inside out. Your language will change. Your reactions will change. Your desires will change. Your thought patterns will change. Your passions will change. That's because he takes out that rebellious heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh. That rebellious heart is controlled by sin and selfish desires. That heart of flesh is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's where the cleansing continues to go. Because, see, not only does he give you a new heart, but he gives you the controller for the new heart. God gives a new spirit. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This spirit that would come in as Ezekiel looked down the road, this would be the Holy Spirit that would come into believers' hearts. And do you realize the wonderful benefits of being possessed by the Holy Spirit? It's an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit enables you to live for God, as Ezekiel saw here. Only a divine act of God can cause a person to live for God. And it's in his giving us of the Holy Spirit that he allows that to happen. The Holy Spirit allows us to understand God's word when we read it. He interprets it. He applies it to our lives. The Holy Spirit can, can, warns us when temptation is around us. And he says, don't do it. Don't go there. And then even when we do give in to temptation, then the Holy Spirit brings conviction so that we can repent of that sin and turn back to God and be cleansed again and restored in a right relationship with God. The Holy Spirit prays for us when we don't know how to pray. 
And he utters in words that we don't understand. And he goes before the Father for us. He comforts us when we are down. And he celebrates with us when we are joyful. The Holy Spirit infills us every single day. He empowers you to do everything that God calls you to do. He makes the Word come alive in you and through you. We need a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit. Some of you need the feeling for the first time when you come to Christ in repentance and faith. And some of us need that fresh feeling that the Lord offers us so that we might continue to serve Him in a new way. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me. Fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Like he did for Israel, God wants to bring you to a place of cleansing. He wants to then give you a shower that will wash you free of the sin in your life. He wants to then give you a new heart of flesh that can be controlled by the Holy Spirit for one glorious purpose. And that purpose is the final step in the cleansing that leads to restoration. And it's this. The result would be that a cleansed Israel would live as God's people in a blessed land. Verse 28, you will live in the land I gave your forefathers. Look at this. You'll be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. For a thousand or so years at this point, Israel had lived as God's people, yet they had never really understood what all that meant. They had struggled with covenant faithfulness, They had run after false gods. They had denied God in so many ways. And they were in Ezekiel's time enduring the consequences of those sins. But God reminded them of his goal for them as his people. It was the same goal that he had given Abraham when he first said, I'm going to build a people for myself. In Genesis 12, God told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a nation. And I'm going to bless you. But the purpose for my blessing is so that you may bless all other nations. And so God says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to cleanse you up. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new spirit. I'm going to use you for what you should always be. You're going to be my God. You're you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to remove the cleansing so that you can fulfill your true purpose. I'm going to bless you. That's God's vision for everyone who will call on the name of the Lord. That's God's vision for everyone who will repent and be saved. That's God's vision for everyone who will say, God, you are my God. He wants to be your God. He wants to be your family's God so that you and your family may live as his people and that he might be your God and he might bring the blessings and purposes that he has for you and your family through you and your family. I guarantee you, God has better plans for you and your family than you have for you and your family. Even the best plans that we could dream of, God has better plans. But hear this, the plans, fulfillment, and the blessings that God has for you will never come until you first go through the cleansing. You must, as a mom, a dad, a grandpa, a grandpa, an aunt, an uncle, a son, a daughter, you've got to step into the place of cleansing. You've got to allow God to wash you under the cleansing shower of the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to submit yourself to the surgeon's hand as he replaces your heart. And you've got to surrender yourself to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Then you'll be ready to see his blessings come into your daily life and into your family's life. So I encourage you this morning to come to the Lord. Maybe it is that you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you need to come in repentance and faith today saying, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I surrender my life to you today. I need to be completely cleansed by your shed blood on the cross. And I surrender my life to you today. Come in and be my Lord and Master. Take over today. It may also be that that you need to come and, and be cleansed afresh. Maybe you know that you're a follower of Christ. You were saved. You've followed the Lord. But you know that you've strayed. And there's some sin that's creeped in. And there's some distractions that have creeped in. And you need to be cleansed. And you need your heart renewed. And you need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit then I'd encourage you to make that commitment today as well. Our song of invitation is a song that prays exactly what we need to be praying today, and that is, I surrender all. Would you make that your prayer today as we go before the Lord and ask Him to speak to our hearts? As we prepare for this time of invitation, would you seek the Lord with me in prayer? Lord, we come before you today, and we surrender everything to you. God, we surrender our lives to you. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room and everyone watching this message would do business with you right now and that, Holy Spirit, you would make clear as to whether or not they have you as their Lord and Savior. And if not, then I pray that they would surrender to you and that they would be saved today by the power of your mighty name. Lord, for others who need a fresh touch, a fresh cleansing, Lord, I pray for them that they would step forward and that they would step into that life-giving flow. Lord, we surrender our all to you today. Speak to us and challenge us as our prayer in these moments. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.